Welcome to this new nutrition business podcast. My name is Julian Melantin, and I'm going to be talking about the wave of failure that's sweeping through the world of plant-based meat substitutes. Those of you who've listened to any of our podcasts before may recall that we did a podcast in September 2022 called The Biggest Failure in Food Industry History, in which we mapped out how it really looked as if the meat substitute makers were heading for a fall. Products had failed to meet consumer expectations, businesses were losing money, and far from meat substitutes being the great disruptive innovation that those companies and their billionaire investors thought they were going to be, it was clearly en route to being the biggest disappointment. Well, eight months later, it's clear that we were right, and the failures are just starting to look bigger and bigger. So what I'm going to do is we're going to run through some of the reasons why plant-based meat substitutes have fallen short of expectations. We're going to look at some of the supermarket sales figures that show that not only are sales not increasing, they're going down. We're going to look at the financials of some of the companies. Yep, they're almost all losing money. We're going to look at a case study of someone who's done it really well. And despite doing everything right for 30 years, even they're having a hard time. So let's start by looking at the US market, which is the one that's had the most attention in terms of plant-based meat substitutes. We'll also talk about the UK and a couple of places, other places in Europe. Um, supermarket sales figures don't lie. You'll often hear big claims for how plant proteins are going to replace 30% of the meat market. I'm pretty sure that someone like Ernst & Young, a big accountancy firm, claimed that. But um, the data that's gathered from the checkout counters of supermarkets by companies like IRI, which is called Circana now, and Nielsen, that always provides the real picture. So the US market for plant-based meat substitutes got to a peak of 1.4 billion in 2021. Now that sounds big, but that's only 1.4% market share of the total US uh, meat market. And then in 2022, sales began to fall. So in the year, they fell by 13.7%. And in the first four weeks of 2023, they were down 24%. They had a little bit of a pushback, but already in 2023, as of uh, 28th of May, it looks like the market's going to be down at least 12.5%. So let's put that, that in context. A 13.7% fall in 2022, a 12.5% fall looking more than likely in 2023. So plant-based meat substitutes going down. What's happened to alternatives? Well, Americans have been eating more chicken. Chicken is the affordable protein with a health halo, fits into everyone's recipes, eating plans, hugely popular meat. If you look at sales of chicken, they have actually increased over the past uh, 18 months. Even beef. Now, beef is a more expensive protein. During economic hard times, when people's budgets are more constrained, as they, are, they increasingly are at the moment, sales of beef typically fall. Well, they haven't been exciting, but the fall's been limited to maybe three, four, five percent, no more than that. Uh, and if you look at the charts produced that show the uh, sales figures, and uh, you can see them in the March 2023 issue of our publication, New Nutrition Business, and other places on our website, you will see there is a massive and growing gap between plant-based meat substitutes, and the other proteins on the market. Now, the best-known brand, one of the two best-known brands on the US market is called Beyond Meat. This is a company who said their goal was to make consumers switch away from consuming meat. Okay, That was their, that was their stated aim back in 2012. They've had about a billion dollars of investment from um, all sorts of uh, financial backers, not from the food industry very much. So last year, they managed to produce sales of about 420 million. That was a fall um, from the previous year. It was at about a 10% decline compared to the previous year. And on their sales of 418 million, they managed to make a loss of 342 million. That's phenomenal. How do you run a business that loses so much money? Well, What's happened with Beyond Meat, and I think a lot of other people in the world of meat substitutes, was they were fooled by that Silicon Valley way of thinking, 
which is something that is much beloved of venture capitalists and other investors, which is you grow sales, you don't worry about profit, and then somehow the profit magically follows. Now, that might be true of the world of tech. That might be true for Silicon Valley. But the world of food is not like that. Food is highly competitive. And um, you're very much at the mercy of the supermarkets. And you can't grow your sales and then whack your prices up to make profit because the supermarkets probably won't agree with that. And besides, the supermarket is full of lots of alternatives, which may be better priced than yours or better ta better tasting. So this Silicon Valley strategy had, was obviously deployed, as is so often the case over the past few years, by investors who thought you could just take ideas from tech and transfer them to food. And they're learning the hard way that wasn't true. None of these problems for people like Beyond Meat are a surprise. So I'm going to list for you why Beyond Meat and many other companies are in, are in trouble. And I'm not being clever after the fact. In fact, we were clever before the fact. No, let me rephrase that. It's not that we're clever. It's just the factors that have caused this market to disappoint the people in it were screamingly obvious five years ago. Number one, the products don't perform on taste and texture. They don't meet consumers' taste expectations. So people have tried them out, and this is true of most countries. They try them out, and they discover the taste just doesn't just justify the repeat purchase. Number two, long and complicated ingredient lists. Some products have as many as 25 ingredients, some a little bit less. There are lots of names on there that people don't understand. They don't look like things you might find in your kitchen cabinet. So understandably, that makes some many people who are more health conscious a bit more hesitant about buying them. The decision by many of the meat substitutes to have such long and complex ingredient lists again reflects their ignorance of the market because what consumers have told the food industry for the past 20 years is they want shorter ingredient lists and ones that are more natural. So there's a trend called clean label. And clean label, which is about making better ingredient lists, has been part of many companies' strategy for the better part of 20 years. Meat substitute people didn't think they needed to pay any attention to that. Hey-ho. What's the other area where meat substitutes fell short? Well, turns out it's sustainability. So one of the claimed selling points for buying meat substitutes is that you're making a more sustainable choice compared to eating beef or lamb. The tricky part is that when the New York Times actually interviewed some companies, including Beyond Meat and Impossible, about their sustainability measures, they found that the companies weren't able to provide the sustainability information they were looking for. In fact, stock market analysts also said to the New York Times, that they weren't able to get the information about sustainability that they were looking for. So while there's a big, broad claim that it's more sustainable, it's incredibly hard to pin businesses down on specifying just what it is that makes them more sustainable. They always claim that they can do, but miraculously, they don't come up with the numbers. And to give you an illustration of that, in the UK, the biggest retailer, grocery retailer called Tesco, they launched a line of plant-based meat substitutes and they were subject to um, criticism for the claims of sustainability that they made. So the advertising regulator asked them to stop their advertising for the product. And why was that? Because Tesco could not produce evidence to the regulator that their products were more sustainable. And in fact, faced with an absence of evidence, the regulator decided to commission their own research into the sustainability of plant-based meat substitutes. And what they found, what they wrote in the report, is that many plant-based meat alternatives were potentially more damaging to the environment than the meat equivalents. So it's unsurprising with this sort of information leaking around, consumers, even if they're highly motivated by sustainability, ask themselves, can I really trust these sustainability messages? And we should also talk about pricing, because it is true that plant-based meat substitutes are more expensive than meat. And the reason for that is relatively simple. Meat is a single ingredient product, whereas meat substitutes have to be assembled from, as I said before, 15, 20, 25 ingredients. Some of those ingredients are very expensive speciality ingredients. If the whole thing has to be put together in a factory, which has all the processing costs that goes with that. And um, as a result of that, 
it is inevitably because it's more processed and more complicated and uses more expensive ingredients, it is more expensive than meat. So the big claims that have been made in recent years, they were going to drive the price down. Well, we were able to find out from talking to people who are experts in making these products, the technical experts, that that probably wasn't going to happen. Um, for those of you who are interested, uh, one of the people we interviewed is a plant protein expert called Paul Hart, and you'll find um, an interview with him uh, on our Spotify page, uh, in which he talks about uh, the challenges of formulating with plant proteins. So for whatever reason, the meat substitute companies and their investors decided to ignore technical knowledge that says it's really difficult to reduce the cost of these things and simply announce to the world that they were going to be cheaper. Now, actually, it shouldn't matter that they're more expensive because in every category in the supermarket, there are premium products that sell very well. When a product is, is delivers value for money to the consumer, and that value for money means it tastes great, you know, they enjoy it, it lines up with their health beliefs, then they are often willing to pay a premium. And within the meat market, there are some really good examples, such as organic meats, meats from grass-fed animals. They're usually sold at a premium to regular meat. In the US market, which is a, a very price-sensitive market, about 10% of the regular meat market is made up of these premium organic and, and other pasture raised and grass fed meats. So for the plant protein people to turn around and say, oh, we have to have a low price for our business to, to work well and for us products to sell, you know, it just doesn't stack up because the meat people are able to charge a high price and get 10% market share. Why? Because those premium meats meet people's expectations of taste, texture, lines up with their sustainability beliefs, and so on and so forth. So the claim constantly that um, if only they could get the price down, they would take off is a bit of a red herring. Um, the evidence is that people will pay more for something, provided the product is good enough. Now, for those of you who think I keep mentioning Beyond Meat, there are lots of other meat substitute companies. Surely they're all doing very well. The answer is um, I mentioned Beyond Meat because they're the best known. Um, but none of the others are doing very well either. Here's an example. Also based in California, Tattooed Chef. You've probably never even heard of them, but they're nearly as big as Beyond Meat. They had sales of about uh, $213 million in 2021. Their financial year ending 2022, they still haven't produced the full financial results for the year, and they've had to admit to the stock market regulator that they can't yet. But what we do know is that in the first nine months of 2022, on sales of 179 million, they made a loss of 79 million. That's impressive. In the first three months of 2023, they produced sales of 59 million. That was down 12% compared to the year before. Now, that's exactly what you expect from those supermarket sales figures, saying the category is down 12%. So they made a, a sales of 59 million. And on that, they produced a loss of 18.8 uh, .8 million. There's nothing unusual about this. This is what the balance sheets and the profit and loss accounts of most plant-based meat substitute businesses look like. And it's not only the US which is in trouble. So let's take another example, which is the UK market. It's probably the biggest market for uh, meat substitutes in Europe. It was worth about 607 million pounds that's 740 million dollars in sales in 2021 it slipped to below 700 million uh in 2022 so sales value was down 6.1 percent volume fell more volume fell by 9.3 percent the market leader corn who've actually been in the substitutes business for 30 years their sales have slid to in 2022 they slid to about 156 million which was down from 186 million at their peak. And that's probably going to be a little bit of a challenge for them because in expectation of continuing market growth, which is the fiction we've all been given for the past five years, they had a whole new factory built in expectation of growth. Now, we don't know what the situation is with that factory, but we can imagine that it's not highly occupied. And it's not just sales that are the problem. Uh, one of the good things about the UK, uh, there are some good things about the UK, but not many, is financial transparency. So we were able to get the financials of 10 
of the top 20 substitute brands in the UK market. Between them, they, these 10 fairly small brands uh, made losses for getting on for $30 million. The cumulative losses on their balance sheets added up to $158 million. Most people, most brands aren't doing very well. An example is Unilever's brand called the Vegetarian Butcher, which it acquired in 2017. It's a, a Dutch brand. It's done pretty well in the Dutch market. Unilever at one point invested about $8 million in marketing for the Vegetarian Butcher, and they earned sales of about $9 million, and it's never really gone above that. So there's no way that they're making money off that one either. Now, one of the interesting things about the UK market is, is this brand corn, which I just mentioned. It uh, sells meat substitutes, which are based on uh, fermented mycoproteins. That's a kind of fermented fungus, a member of the mushroom family, if you like, in very simple terms. Corn is a case study of how a company can do everything right. They've put a big emphasis, as I said, for 30 years on getting the taste and texture right making sure the products are convenient, that they can be used as ingredients in people's cooking, or they, are, they can be ready meals. They've done a great job with the marketing. They've kept everything very simple. They don't overclaim by any means, uh, unlike most people in this business. But even corn has, has suffered from declining sales more recently. Uh, it's not only the biggest in the UK, it's the, the biggest in Europe. And its parent, uh, which is a Filipino multinational called Mond Nissin, recently had some interesting and revealing things to say based on its most recent financial results. So looking at the beginning of 2023, Mond Nissin, which is you know, it's a diversified group, they're in noodles and cookies and all sorts of other things. Speaking about their, their meat substitutes business, they said the UK market, the marketplace had actually uh, declined by 10.5% already in 2023. Corn is down a little bit, but has done a much better job than the other players. So this challenge of consumer acceptance not being what was forecast, you find this in lots of markets. In uh, Spain, for example, there's a brand called Hura, H-E-U-R-A. Nice brand. They've tried ha hard, got a shorter ingredient list. I think their sales recently grew from about 17 million euros to 34 million euros in one year. That's, that's absolutely great, but it doesn't make a profit. And the company announced in the beginning of 2023 that it was their intention to lay off some of their staff and make cost cuts with the intention of heading towards profitability. As it's a private company, we, we don't know what the losses are. And it's not just, I'll say that again, and it's not just the brands that are in trouble, some suppliers of ingredients for this business, the plant proteins are in difficulty. So a recent uh, example was a plant protein ingredient developer in Canada called Merit Functional Foods. It's gone into receivership. Uh, that's bad news for the Canadian taxpayer, who had apparently handed over $95 million to uh, support their investment. Uh, Merit had a state-of-the-art factory able to process 100,000 tons of canola and peas to make protein from it. They had some good customers lined up, such as Dyer Foods, which is a US company who are big in dairy alternatives. And they're part of a Japanese group called Otsuka, who are normally very successful. Um, but to give you an idea, uh, in the nine months to December 2022, Merit made sales of just $5.6 million, on which it made a loss of $12.7 million. That was double its losses in 2021. Now, Merit's biggest shareholder is a Another Canadian company called Burkon Nutriscience. They have a 30% stake of merit. And Burkon Nutriscience is another company who are big in plant proteins and the intellectual property around them. But according to their published figures, they don't seem to make a profit either. In the nine months to December 2022, they made a loss of $4 million. And in fact, their balance sheet shows cumulative losses since the company was created of $96.7 million. Now, I could go on and on listing brands and ingredient companies who are losing money and either folding or on the edge of folding. And you may say that it's easy to be wise after the event, but I'd just like to point out that nothing that we're saying today is, is really being wise after the event because, and you can see this if you look on a website called foodnavigator.com, I said in public for the first time in 2019, 
that the growth expectations for meat substitutes would be way, way below what was being claimed at the time. And we felt it would be a big niche, a niche business. Nothing wrong with that. If you can make a profit in a niche, it's a great way to run your business. But we really felt the big growth expectations could not be substantiated. So we were pessimists, if you like. The results that I've just been telling you about are even worse than we imagined would be the case. We never thought the market would actually fall. Now, some of you will be thinking, but surely we're always being told that people are reducing their meat consumption. And here's another challenge. You have to be very careful about messages that you hear about consumers' beliefs and behaviors. So first of all, never believe anything you read in the media. Sounds like a very bold statement, doesn't it? But there's a very good reason for it. The olden days where journalists sat around and checked facts and phoned people and tried to find things out, those have gone. Today, the media has lots and lots of white space on its website that it has to fill. And it employs young journalists on low salaries, and they're given targets, like you have to post five stories a day. And the stories have to get clicks, because clicks means advertising revenue. So no matter what their intentions may be, those journalists do not have time to investigate, to learn, to become expert in a subject. So what they do is when a press release comes in, they maybe change a few sentences, but basically they reproduce it. So a lot of the time, what you have seen in the mainstream media about plant-based meat substitutes are going to transform everything was just the reproduction of a press release. And you may be thinking, but consumer research said that more people are going to become flexitarian. And that is another problem because there's been an awful lot of research around, sadly produced by ingredient companies, but sometimes produced by environmental activists uh, and various universities that always looks at what people say they are going to do. Very rarely does it look at what people are doing. And when we do consumer research, which we do both qualitatively and quantitatively, that's what we try to do. We try to find out how people are really behaving. And that's it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, which is why I guess a lot of people bypass that. So the trend of reducing meat consumption was definitely growing from 2012 onwards. And if in our own five country survey, so that covers Australia, UK, United States, Spain, and Brazil, in our own five country survey back in 2014, about 14% of people were actually reducing their meat consumption. That had grown to 20% by the time you get to 2018. It had grown to 23% by the time you get to 2020. But that rate of growth has begun to slow. In 2022, it was 24%. So it's really kind of within the margin of error compared to the two years previously. And it's important to bear in mind that people's beliefs about food and health are much more fragmented than they were in the past. People got access to a huge diversity of information about food and health. And as a result, it's no longer possible to say that a change in consumer behavior will become mass and that everyone will do it. Things tend to plateau, changes in behavior surge, and then they plateau at a much lower level than would have been the case in the past. So 24% of people reducing their meat consumption, yep, that's probably the ceiling. Based on what we see in other areas of health, you get to a group of people around that kind of level, and then it doesn't spread any further, because other people have found other things to do for their health. So this is a really important point. What the food industry has fallen down on in the past few years, uh, and in particular, the world of investment, whose money has really propelled this meat substitute market, is the basics of critical thinking. Asking yourself the tough questions. What is really going on? How do I know what's going on? Why is it going on? It's clear that there was a huge overestimation of the growth rate in the future of the substitutes market. There was an overestimation of its size, and that led to all these false expectations and lots of products being launched that should never have been launched. People do want to add more plants into their diet, but what they're really looking for are vegetables, honest vegetables and spices and herbs, things that they understand. 
So to give you an example, there is a, a, a brand in the Netherlands. It also sells in Germany and the UK. It's called Lazy Vegan. They sell frozen ready meals uh, so that people can, who want a plant-based diet can have plants in a, an easy, convenient form. And each 400 gram single serve meal contains at least 200 grams of actual vegetables. So let me read some of them out from one of their ingredient lists. Tomato, cauliflower, potato, chickpeas, spinach, onion, carrots, coconut, coriander, ginger, turmeric, cumin, red chili powder, fenugreek, cardamom. This is all just natural food. It's a long list, but it's all stuff the consumer can recognize. And it says that it's all about vegetables on the front of the pack. This is what consumers really want, not meat substitutes. They don't want something that's pretending to be meat. And again, this is not new knowledge because the market for ready meals and snacks that have a percentage of plants inside them, particularly vegetables, has been around for some time, 20 years. Now, the fact that what most people really want is more vegetables, not meat substitutes, has been known for a long time. And there have been businesses quietly getting on with delivering that need. Now, while we might all prefer to eat vegetables in their whole form, the reality is a lot of people, because of their, their jobs, you know, if you're a nurse who's worked a 12-hour shift and you finish at 6 p.m., you don't have time necessarily to prepare your vegetables from, from scratch. There are people looking for convenient ways to get those vegetables. So alongside Lazy Vegan, in the U.S., there's a brand, for example, called Veggies Made, Made Great. For 15 years, it's been selling bakery products where the number one ingredient is a vegetable. So um, they sell a muffin, for example, and the, the biggest ingredient that is zucchini or courgettes. And vegetables make up around 35% of the product. In Finland, Fatsa, which is uh, one of the biggest bakery groups in the Scandinavian countries, it's been selling a range of breads which are one third vegetables, again, since about 2015, and it's been growing quietly. It seems a real pity that the companies who have been quietly doing the thing that consumers really wanted, giving them vegetables in a more convenient way, and always in relatively simple products, have been completely overshadowed by all the media attention that has been paid to the world of meat substitutes. One area, where there is some growing demand for meat substitutes uh, is, is in food service. So that's basically like canteen and lunchtime meals. Um, and in fact, Mont Nissin, the owner of Corn, it reported that um, uh, its food service business in Europe was actually going quite well compared to its business in the supermarket. And the reason for that is food service is a bit behind the grocery business. So the Meat substitutes have been coming into that market a bit later, but it's also the case uh, that the, they're a little bit more aligned with consumer expectations there. So the lunchtime salad bar has been a fixture of most company canteens for the better part of 25 years. A lot of the time at lunchtime, people are eating with their colleagues. So it is still a time of the day when people want to eat healthily. Normally the hierarchy goes, people have their healthiest meal at breakfast. They eat quite healthy at lunchtime. And then by the time they get home, they're ready to move into a little bit more indulgence. But at lunchtime, that's still in the zone of I want to eat healthy. Plus, people are sitting with friends or colleagues, not always the same thing. And they want to be seen, many of them, not everyone, but they do want to be seen to be you know, eating healthily, making a good choice. For many people, that's part of their, their identity. So choosing a meat substitute at lunchtime aligns with those those wishes. So it isn't surprising to see that business growing. Again, it's not going to become mass because ultimately taste is going to be an issue at a, a certain point, even in food service, but it'll grow for a little while yet. It is interesting how the huge amount of attention paid to plant-based meat substitutes for the past seven, eight, nine, ten years has taught us, as if we needed to know it again, the importance of delivering foods that meet people's taste and texture expectations of delivering foods that have short and understandable ingredient lists. It's also taught us some additional things, which is that we have to be very skeptical about what people claim from consumer research. Consumer research can be excellent, but it's just a perspective. And in particular, we must be very careful not to base plans or strategies 
on what we read in the media, because the media is no longer there to inform us. It's there to get clicks for advertising. And finally, it's really important, I think, to keep people in the world of venture capital and private equity and big finance out of food production. Because what they're looking for is not to steadily grow a business that adds to human health and pleasure. What they really want to do is to ramp up a business as quickly as possible so they can get out in five, six, seven years and make their next billion dollars. Because of the importance of food for sustainability and for human health and the role it has in our society and in farming, and because it's an industry with almost no profitability in it, I know that's hard to believe, but if you really want to live a life where you're paid badly and make no profit, try running a food company. It's just not the right type of business for those get-rich-quick financiers to be involved in. So anyone who's thinking about setting up a food company, basically try to avoid getting money in from people from venture capital firms. We've, we've sat round tables with any number of them in the past 10 years, and I never cease to be amazed about how little they understand about food and the consumer. And what's going to happen with meat substitutes? For the foreseeable future, for the next 12 months, there is no reason to believe that this disaster isn't going to continue. And one of the things that's going to keep fueling that is the decline in consumers' purchasing power because of high interest rates, because of inflation, because of slowing economies like Germany, even on the edge of recession. People are going to be much more careful about how they spend their money. They're going to expect to really get some value for money. And if plant-based meat substitutes don't deliver value for money in the good times, they're definitely not going to be doing that in the hard times. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to know more about us, please go to our website, which is www.new-nutrition.com. You can find me holding forth all the time on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And uh, we strongly suggest that if you haven't already done it, you go to our website and you take out a subscription to our monthly publication, which will keep you informed about developments in the world of food and health in a much more insightful, informed and useful way than you will find from any other source in our industry. I hope you all have a nice day.